let's talk about hybrid work and what that means. Now, way back when, do you remember when we had the first COVID shots, the vaccines, and that was the, actually the first time of the return to office in the summer of 2021? probably remember that. That was a great time. People were still shocked that the vaccines came so quickly. And so you already started having the first challenges with returning to the office in the fall of 2021. And I was working with a large company. It's a Fortune 2500 company. And the CHRO of that company, we were on the phone and we're talking about the four problems she saw with returning to the office. What were the challenges? And she's kind of a religious person. And so she used this metaphor of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so I asked her if I could steal it and share it with my other clients. And she said, sure, happy to steal it. Happy to have you steal it. So let's talk about what are the four horsemen of the mandated return to office that that company had. Now, the first horseman is resistance. So you'll have a lot of resistance. And that is a big, big challenge. And we'll talk about what that means. Then attrition. You've heard of the Great Resignation. Major part of that is the return to office drive. Then you have quiet quitting. Again, common term. You've heard of that. I'll define it for those who haven't. And finally, loss of diversity and inclusion. This is the thing that people tend to forget most, but it's really important to consider. So let's talk about the first horseman resistance. That is a big challenge for the largest companies and smallest companies. But let's talk about one cautionary tale of General Motors, GM. Now, on a Friday in late in 2022, last year, they announced they're going to go back to the office three days a week. And they got a really intense employee backlash. So by Tuesday of the next week, the CEO had to roll back the plan, say that we were wrong, that was not what we planned, and they suffered a lot of loss of credibility. So that's not something you want to be in. That is not a good position to be in. And resistance like that seriously undermines credibility. And we have a number of other examples, of course, where we have a lot of resistance undermining credibility. Apple is another good example. Now, Apple employees are notoriously loyal. So Apple mandated three days a week, and even though they're known to be compliant and loyal, that was not something that they were happy with. So that faced a lot of backlash, and they ended up, actually over a thousand employees, ended up signing a petition against this return to office, which is pretty surprising for Apple. Now, another example is, of course, Amazon. That's much more recent right now, right? Within the last few months, they just announced suddenly, out of the blue, without consultation. I mean, Apple at least had like a long term saying, we will go to the office. And Amazon, early in the pandemic, announced that they'll be flexible, have flexibility. So people moved away, people moved wherever. They arranged their lives around being flexible. And uh, Apple announced three days in the office, you had a major explosion. Something like over 25,000 signed a petition and you just had a walkout. Just a couple of weeks ago, people walked out of, and this was after Amazon cut something like over 10,000 jobs. So people knew that their jobs might be at stake when they walk out, but they still had a walkout protest. So that's open resistance, but you have more Informal forms of resistance, uncompliance. That is another big form of resistance. So this is something I talk with clients who want to return to the office as a big, big issue. You'll have a lot of non-compliance. So firms that mandate a return to the office, they face up to 50%. I've seen up to 50% non-compliance. That seems high, but that's exactly, that is what happens. <laughs> Some just refuse to show up. They dare you to fire me. And the people who refuse to show up tend to be more senior people, even people managers. They refuse to show up and they say, well, are you going to fire me? <laughs> they, they know that how valuable they are for companies. Now, some come in only one or two days if three days is required. And some come in for an hour or two, like if they have a meeting plan, they come in for that, hour, for that meeting and then go back home. 
So that's another form of non-compliance. Many managers refuse to discipline their staff. I was talking to a high-level executive of a pharma company who tells me that his staff come in, maybe they're required to come in three days. They come in maybe one, two days, and he's just covering for them. He's not telling the leadership team, he's not telling the HR, he's just letting them do it, partially because he thinks it's a stupid rule and he feels like being non-compliant himself. <laughs> So that's something you definitely see pretty often. Now, what do companies actually do? How do they respond to non-compliance? And I was talking to the CHRO yesterday, I was on the phone with the CHRO of a major Fortune 500 high-tech manufacturer who just lost a boardroom battle about forcing their employees back to the office. She was against it, the leadership team overruled her, so she of course has to support them in the public, behind closed doors, she's trying to figure out how to mitigate the situation. And she knows that the resistance will be the first thing they face. Now, only 3% of companies actually end up firing employees. Something like 30% have HR talk to them. And that's according to a survey by Gardner. Okay, other stuff. 47% of bosses just ignore defined employees like that executive at the pharma company I mentioned. Something like 14% issue verbal reprimands, 10% give negative performance reviews, which is what Google is threatening to do. We'll see if they actually go through with it. And then 15% reduce the pay of non-compliant employees. And that's a survey, and 12% threaten termination. So there's a difference between the 12% threatening termination and the 3% who actually terminate. <laughs> and so that's a survey of companies by Stanford University. Now, at my clients, what do they do? They end up doing some of these things, not all. Some just kind of ignore non-compliance and non-managerial roles. They don't think it's that important, and managers often cover for them. Some issue verbal reprimands, some reduce pay. None of them do things like negative performance reviews or terminating people. Okay, let's talk about the second horseman, attrition, losing staff. This, again, a major part of the great resignation was the attrition. Of the attrition of people who are forced to return to the office. So you're definitely seeing that. You're still seeing high quit rates right now. I just saw it was 3.8 million recent last month, which is still pretty high compared even in our current economy of the, it's, we still have a pretty tough labor market. It's 3.7% unemployment, hard for employers. So, attrition. What's happening with attrition? What does that mean? Amazon, Apple, GM, many other companies are facing serious problems with attrition, including at the highest level. So this is not just rank and file staff. This is really high level staff who they're losing. So consider Apple's head of AI, Ian Goodfellow. And we know how important AI is right now in the current market, right? He sent an email to his staff when he departed saying that, quote, I believe strongly that more flexibility would have been good for my team, unquote. And it's something that he left for that purpose. 42% of companies that mandate to return to the office report having higher attrition than they anticipate. So they anticipate some attrition, but they actually end up having higher attrition than they anticipated. And that's according to a survey by Unispace. I'll talk about that survey in a little bit later. So we clearly see attrition is a serious problem with a mandated return to the office. Now, talk about the data a little bit. So there was a study by Stanford University uh, in a company called Trip.com, which is a major travel agency. And I know I shared about that study with a couple of people before. So it randomly assigned employees, half of their employees, to work in the traditional schedule, full-time in the office, like a number of companies are trying to go to JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, the client company I mentioned earlier. Now, they assigned the other half of their staff to work in a flexible manner. So come to the office, something like half time, something like that, so on a hybrid schedule. And these are people who are in those roles like marketing, customer, service, call centers, programming, HR, operations of various roles travel agency people. So in all roles, half of them were in the office and half of them, full-time half of them were in the office part of the time in the flexible manner. Now, after six months, 
what they found was the significant flexibility group had 35% better retention. 35% better retention. I want you to think about that. That's six months. That's huge. That's incredible. Like if you can have an intervention that gives you 5% better retention, how much money does that save? That's a huge money saver. This is 35% better retention for giving people like half of their time to be flexible. And they had higher productivity. So some things like HR, it's harder to measure, but some things are much easier to measure, like programming. So the people who are working flexibly, again, these are the same roles, wrote 8% more code, more lines of code. And these are people, they're, not, they're, they're under the same system. So writing of code was a good measure for the ones who are in the office and the ones who are at home. So clearly, people are more productive individually when they're working from home. After the trial, they naturally changed all their staff to have flexibility, to have that flexibility, have time in the office. How many days work best? That's a frequent question. So when we're getting deep into hybrid, one of the challenging things about hybrid, hybrid, by the way, is not something that's just invented. It's been there for a very long time since we started being able to do telework. And we know that the number of hybrid days was something like around, number of days worked from home was something around one, 1% at the turn of the century, then it was by 2010, it was something like 4%, then it was by end of, by 2019, it was something like 6%, and now the latest figures are something like 27%. So the pandemic simply exacerbated previous trends. It's not like this is completely new. And so how many days work best is a long time. This is something that people were wondering for a long time. And now we have some data. So peer-reviewed research that shares some data. So a recent study by Harvard Business School at a large company randomly assigned staff. So randomly assigning is the best comparison to two different schedules. So one schedule, group A, was less than one day in the office. So fully remote, maybe coming in once a month, something like that. Then the second group was one to two days in the office, closer to one day in the office. And the last group was three to five days in the office, closer to three days in the office for most people. And what they found is that group B performed best. So one to two days in the office is the group that performed best. And there are specific characteristics where it performed best. Best work output as measured by managers. Then greatest satisfaction with their job. And this last thing I found really surprising, that they had the highest social engagement, strongest social connections. I would have thought that group C, when I first saw the study, I thought that group C would have had the highest social connections. But it turned out that group B one to two days in the office, they spend their time in the office. When they came to the office, much more doing social engagement. And that's why in the end, they actually had better social connections. So just, again, so it was surprising to me. Now, yeah, briefly. Not really, not as far as I know. It, it's about internal company dynamics. So we know that in larger cities, it's definitely better for people to have more flexibility. Like the, the thing that the employees hate the most about working in the office is the commute. Something like 79% cited as the top reason why they don't want to go into the office. And it's worse in large cities, which is one of the reasons you see the people who are working in the office in larger cities, right now they are less populated. So New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco have less people working downtown than cities like where I'm from, Columbus, Ohio, or Houston or something. They, they definitely play a role. I don't know if critical is the right word. They, they definitely play a role, like the, the amount of commuting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Yes. So we talked about commuting. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
So we talked about commuting was is a really important dynamic. And what we find is that on average, workers commute over an hour in the United States. So something just like something like 55 minutes driving over and over an hour with all the putting on clothing and you know all the, all the stuff that you need to do transition time. Then in larger cities like San Francisco, like Los Angeles, like New York City, it's closer to two hours or more. It's called the supercomputers. <laughs> so that uh, and that's kind of one way. Uh, so this could be really bad. But on average, something larger cities would be two hours, something, and that's people really hate that. <laughs> okay, Sherm Research Society for Human Resources found that people are really eager when they're changing their jobs to look for a full-time work from home jobs. 48% of survey respondents are looking for a full-time work from home job. And this is something that's actually matched by LinkedIn data. So LinkedIn finds that something like the last data I saw was from a month ago, when around 13% of all job ads on LinkedIn were for fully remote work. And they got over half of the increase on LinkedIn. So it's definitely matched by real world behavior in this survey. To take a full time job with a 30 minute commute would require people to be paid 20% more. And for half time with a 30 minute commute would be require them to be paid 10% more. So there's no question, and I've seen this with my clients who I help transition to figuring out their remote work, hybrid work, that employees are willing to take less money if they have the option of additional flexibility. I do not recommend cutting people's pay, just to be clear. But if you're hiring people, you are going to be need to less money to have an attractive offer. And you'll, if you're raising their wages, you'll want to raise the wages of the people who are spending more time in the office higher and faster. Now, let's talk about the Greenhouse Candidate Experience Report. This was a good one. So what percent are ready to leave if firms go back on flexibility? we find that something like 76% of people are ready to look for a new job if their firms increase the amount of time that they're spending in the office. So the CHRO I was speaking with yesterday knows this, and she knows that this is going to be a big, big issue. That because they're going from a something like two to three day model to four then five day model, then they're gonna have a lot of losses. And even worse for historically underrepresented groups by 22%. So 22% more likely to look for new jobs if they come from historically underrepresented groups. So you're losing especially diversity. Now, another survey that I mentioned earlier, the Unispace Returning for Good report. So we see very clearly that firms that mandate office returns are more likely to lose employees than they thought. So their attrition is more. They have, they anticipated some attrition, but they actually had 42% higher attrition. And they had worse feelings about the office. The top feelings of office about the, of employees about the office is happy, motivated, and excited. So those are good feelings, but those fall substantially if there's a mandated office return. So people are less happy about the office. And that's the fall. Okay, and then the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve, obviously, very credible source. Their survey of household economics and decision-making asked how much do employees value a flexible work model. So they find if people are forced to shift from a flexible model to a model that's less flexible, they have the same negative feelings as they would if they had a 2-3% two, two, pay cut. And you know how much people hate that. It's not actually, they don't have like a lack of an increase. They actually have a pay cut. And people hate pay cuts. <laughs> so companies very much don't like to do pay cuts because they know how disengaging they are. So that's a serious problem. Now, what do you do to reduce attrition? This is a huge question, big, big conversation. So the first thing is empathy. This is the first question. This is the most essential tool. You want to show people that you understand them, that you care about their feelings, that people like Elon Musk are a good example of what not to do. <laughs> just saying that you need to go in the office just because you need to go in the office, it's part of the job, 
that is not what people learned during the pandemic. It changed. People's sense of what they need to do changed. So simply demanding office presence is a great way to lose talented staff. Instead, what you need to do is you need to show that you understand the employee's perspective. So spending years successfully during the pandemic and leaders may perceive them to not be as successful, but people perceive themselves to be successful. So you need to understand where they are coming from. Many see a requirement to come in several days as a heavy burden and an unfunded mandate that disrupts their lives and costs them time and money. So that's where people are coming from. You need to understand them and you need to empathize with them. Now, what is that? Yes, there's a question. In, in terms of how much they do not want to come to the office? Yeah, so we see that the people who want to come to the office least are millennials. Not Gen Zs, which is what people typically think, but millennials are the ones who want to have the least desire to come to the office. Then comes Gen Zs. And partially we think when talking to Gen Zs, it's because they know that coming to the office provides them with mentoring and some support. The Gen Zs are the ones who want to do five days least. So they're the ones most likely to leave if they are asked to come to the office five days. But millennials are the most ones who are most likely to want full-time remote work. And then Gen X and then baby, baby members, not in that order. Hmm? Sure, yeah. So people in leadership, you definitely see that managers who are millennials are much more flexible about giving their employees because they understand that. Mm -hmm. So how much money and time does it cost? Well, let's talk about that. So you need to understand where their people are coming from. The average office workers cost when they're working from home, according to our labs, research by our labs. So first financially, coming, working from home costs $432 a month on average. And that's utilities, office supplies, things like this. What about working from the office? It's 863 per month. It's huge, it's over $400 more. So over $5,000 more per year. Because of course you have to have commuting gas and so on. And that doesn't include relocation costs. So the company I, to, whose CHRO I talked to, they hired a number of people remotely. And now these people are gonna be forced to come in. It's, at and has been in the news for this. They allowed full-time flexibility to people. And then just a couple of weeks ago, they said, you need to come to the office. And then they also consolidated all their offices where previously they had hundreds of offices around the country. Now they have nine central locations and they're not even paying the relocation costs. So it's not great. Now, time is another consideration. So I talked a little bit about commuting. Average daily commute is over an hour and much more in larger urban areas. So it costs people a lot to come to the office. So you need to answer the question, what are you coming to the office for? That needs to be the fundamental question that you answer for people to not a trip. So you need to show empathy in your communication. That is cardinal. That is the key thing that you want to be thinking about. Don't ignore the elephant in the room. Acknowledge that people have pains and costs that they need to take their time, take their energy, take their money to come to the office. So show that you recognize them and share the story of your own challenges. So this is something that, for example, the CHRO, she actually, she doesn't live on campus. She lives during the pandemic. She moved away to take care of her ailing father and she's still not living actually at the location of the office. It's a global company, but at the main location. And so she's definitely struggling. She's coming, she has to travel to the main campus for several days each week and then travel home for the weekend. And that's not great. She's having a lot of work-life balance stress. So I strongly recommend it to her that she share that story that you talk about it, that you didn't just hide it behind closed doors. It's a struggle for everyone, so you need to show empathy. And, of course, the company itself needs to show empathy by offering payments, because that's the language of companies, <laughs> offering payments. So if you don't want people to touch it, don't just increase their salary, except if they're key staff. You want to specifically pay them for the pain points that they're experiencing. This is really key. So I'm coming from behavioral science background, People really need to connect. 
what the company is paying for to their pain points. Pay for their commuting, IRS mileage drive, mileage rate for driving, parking costs, public transit, if they're lucky enough to be able to take public transit. Then their lunch costs, that's a second big concern for people. Get local restaurants, cater lunch, and so on. This is another, this is a really nice opportunity if you're catering lunch or if you're paying for local restaurants to do more socializing, to get people together, go in a group, have a senior employee, take several junior employees out, have some mentoring going on. So that's a nice opportunity. Pay for the relocation, of course. So for those who moved away from campus and pay for care, for child care and elder care. That's really important if you don't want to lose people. And salary increases for key staff, like Ian Goodfellow. <laughs> you don't want to lose this. So that's when you want to be thinking about attrition. Okay, third horse, quiet quitting. Now, you've heard this term, of course, I'm sure. So quiet quitting refers to people being psychologically disengaged from their work. It's people who are just getting enough to, done treating their job like a job rather than a career, not really trying to move up. So this is something that we've, quiet quitting was a thing before the pandemic, obviously, and it's not new, but the extent of it is definitely exacerbated by the mandated return to the office. This is a big challenge. Quiet quitting can be worse than resistance or attrition. And that's because quiet quitting, when done extensively, can rot a company's culture from within. So it's something to really worry about when people don't think about this enough, how dangerous and problematic quiet quitting can be if you actually have the people in the office, if they don't attrit. That's a problem. So, impact of the first, first return to the office. According to Google, it, I'm sorry, according to Gallup, forcing employees to come to the office leads to disengagement, fear, and distrust. And so, this is, according to Ben Wygest, who is the Gallup Director of Research and Strategy for Workplace Management, I'm gonna read this, quote, employee experience, employees experience significantly lower engagement, significantly lower well-being, significantly higher intent to leave, and significantly higher levels of burnout. And the optimal engagement boost occurs when employees spend 60 to 80% of their time, three to four days in a five-day work week working off-site. So again, working on-site one to two days, same thing that the Harvard Business School study found. So, very credible research. Now, Future Forum report found, this is about connections between people. It found that remote workers compared to fully in office workers are going to be more likely to feel connected to their direct manager and to the company's values, which people don't really think about. They think that remote employees are going to be disconnected. But if you structure it right, they're not going to be disconnected. They're more likely, they're equally likely to feel connected to their immediate teams. And of course, they're going to be more likely to be productive. So workers with full schedule flexibility compared to those with fully rigid schedules are going to have much higher productivity, 29% higher productivity and 53% better ability to focus, which is understandable because they're not being distracted by everybody having video conference calls around them and talking about talk, talking around them in this open office arrangement because the open office is a terrible arrangement. We can talk about that in the Q&A and that's the most typical arrangement for companies. So, flexible remote work policies were cited as the number one factor in improving company culture over the past two years. Huge boost. Now, Cisco survey. This was global, so the previous ones were US. I'll give you a little bit of global context, including the US. So it found that if you have significant remote workability, so over half the work week, you're going to have much more well-being. 78% reported better well-being, 79% reported better work-life balance. Now, 51 said that remote work strengthened their friendships, and 74 said that it improved their family relationships. So this is really interesting. When you look at remote work, most people think that having significant remote work over half the work week causes social isolation. When you actually dig deeper into it, what you see is that there's social isolation from your coworkers. Of course, you spend less time with your coworkers. But that doesn't mean people have that loneliness problem. It depends on their other relationships. It strengthens their ability, their relationships with their family members. It strengthens their relationships with their friends. So if people are isolated at home, if there are no other people at home, 
yes, they're going to be lonely, especially if they're going to be introverted. I'm sorry, extroverted. So introverts are not going to have nearly as much of a problem. But extroverts who are alone will have a problem. If they have, work, if they have friends or family, they're not going to have that problem. Yes, Chris. So, So that's, a, that's in the workplace. So in the workplace, yes, strong ties get strengthened if with the immediate team members. Weak ties get weakened. That's definitely a problem. Outside the workplace, no. I mean, in terms of if you, have, yeah, if you spend more time at home, you have more ability to engage with weak ties, which is your community. So people, let's say, people go to their church, they go to their clubs, they go to their running, whatever they do at that time, they have stronger weak ties. Now, 82% say that the ability to work from anywhere made them happier. 55% said the ability to work from anywhere decreased their stress. And so the implications, of course, of this is that mandatory return to the office, of course, harms well-being, leads to burnout, and contributes to quiet quitting. Let's talk about that. How do you address it? This is a big problem. So if you do want to build, bring your employees back to the office, what do you do? So I work with my clients to figure out, okay, what to do about this problem. You want to address the single biggest issue of frustration. Just coming to the office and doing this exact same stuff you'd be doing at home. This is not something you want to have. You want to figure out how to minimize the amount of time that your employees spend commuting. You're going to have a worse experience for hybrid meetings. You're not going to have a good time. So you want to create an in-office experience that solves this problem. That is going to be the fundamental key. When Carl was talking about how do you solve hybrid. This is the key to solving hybrid. You want to figure out how to have the right experience in the office that employees feel it's worth it to come to the office for that time. And my book will talk a little bit about that in much more depth. But the only good reasons to come to the office other than accessing physical resources like R&D, manufacturing, whatever you need to do, are collaboration. More intense forms of collaboration, synchronous collaboration, are definitely better done in the office for the large majority of people. Now, nuanced conversations. So when you want to have conversations about performance conflicts, when you want to have conversations about conflict resolution, when you want to have conversations about the leaders conveying her, his strategy to the team members, those are good conversations to have in the office, nuanced ones. Then socializing, team building, so on, definitely better done in the office. And finally, mentoring and training. Mentoring on the job training, definitely better done in the office. Those are very high value, high stakes activities, no question about it. But they take up something like 10 to 15% of a typical employee's workday. That's about how much it takes. The things that people spend the large majority of their time on are much better done at home, which is doing their email, doing their Microsoft Teams messages, Slack, and so on. So asynchronous communication. Then video conference calls. Absolutely no need for you to come to the office and distract everyone with your video conference call and be distracted by others or phone calls. And then your individual head down work, writing reports, figuring out programming, coding, research, whatever you're doing, all of these sorts of things, copywriting, design, all of these things head down to work better done at home. No need to come to the office and waste your time doing that. So it's a very important conversation when I work with my clients is figuring out how do you minimize the amount of time that your teams need to come to the office. That needs to be a big, big part of the conversation. Because if you can show your employees that, hey, we're not having meetings scheduled five days a week, <laughs> we are trying to minimize the amount of time you're coming to the office work. If you're part of a single team, usually you can get it down to one, to one day a week in the office. If you're part of two teams or three teams, might be two days, the extreme kind of three days, but usually two days if you're part of a couple of teams. So you want to try to figure out how can you minimize the amount of time that people are coming to the office? And then people feel, okay, that's justified. I can see why that's necessary. I can see that it's better to do these things in the office. So people have that buy-in. And you need to let the teams decide themselves what works best for the team.
Yeah, and that's what the, I mentioned, the trip.com study. So it found that people were working a seven-day work week. They were not working just coming to the office. They were working, so the programmers, for example, they did not work as much during the five days, but they got work done during the, the additional two days. And because they had like live stuff during those two days, during those five days, and they also spread out their time of work. So you have overall, people are doing more work. Yes, I mentioned if you require physical resources, of course you need to come to the office. So if you have manufacturing or if you have R&D, other things like this, if you need to have client meetings, of course, come to the office, although some clients might prefer to meet you. Yeah. So definitely technology facilitates this. So yeah, and when you're in manufacturing, so I mentioned the CHRO of the manufacturing company, high-tech manufacturing. They have a third of their workforce needs to be in the office, but two thirds doesn't. They can work from anywhere. So just because a third of your workforce needs to be in the office doesn't need to mean you need to force the rest of your workforce to be in the office, right? And that's what we're talking about also, the payments. So if people need to come to the office, then you should be paying them for the activities that they need to do to come to the office. And so that helps ameliorate the disparities. So facilitate socializing. Yes, there was a question. Well, one last question before I go. Yeah, hi. I have a two part question. Okay. So the first part is uh, you talked about right, being re working remote helps in building relationships right uh, as part of the study now that is probably for existing ones like for example when we go to the office there are a lot of you know conversations that we have and uh, near the cooler we discover a lot of people right so is there any study on that in terms of expanding the social the network in the office and the second part of the question is uh when somebody joined the company and has never visited the office has only interacted in a portal and outlook and teams right what is their sense of belonging yeah. belongingness to the company understanding the values and culture and all that yeah. compared to say people who have gone to offices so is there any study on these two yeah there's definitely studies so you see that when people are working remotely they have weaker weak ties so, which was mentioned earlier. So, ties with people who are not in their immediate team, those are weakened. No question about that. So, that's definitely an issue and there's weaker mentoring. If you just let things go on as they are. And so, this, this applies to the, the, the second part of the question. Mentoring is definitely weakened when you work remotely. And so, those are the things that are best done in the office. The on-the-job training, like I said, the four things, collaboration, socializing, so what you're talking about, socializing definitely better done in the office. Uh, On-the-job training and mentoring, definitely better done in the office. Okay, facilitating socializing and collaboration. You want to have fun experiences for people, facilitate them. Have out-of-the-box experiences, especially if you're, if this is the early time when they're coming to the office, escape room events so, and so on, and just occasional social events, parties. Have stuff that people can engage with and enjoy and train managers on leading hybrid teams so that time in the office is spent focusing on collaborative activities. Time at home is spent preparing for those activities and focusing on their individual tasks. So facilitate this, facilitate these activities that are best done in the office by doing that. And invest in training. So you want to train especially the people who are more recently hired. So in the professional development for people who are hired during the pandemic is really important. They, this is 
making sure that they are fully integrated is a challenge. And so you want to invest into training for these people when they're in the office, especially. So going back to that question, you want to create good training, good on the job mentoring. So I work with all clients to develop a mentoring program for people that's going to be usually office-based or at least start in the office so that people are getting good mentoring. And don't forget longer tenured staff. They appreciate getting training as well. Now, start with training on how to work in a hybrid setting, what to do at home, what to do in the office, how to collaborate effectively, and how to have hybrid meetings, which is definitely a challenge. Now, you also want to revise the office space. Don't keep it the same. The office space needs to be more collaborative. And of course, you want some technologies around that. So redesigning office space to be much more collaborative, since most work in the office is going to be collaborative and staff will focus on their individual tasks at home. And so a number of you who can join digital and so on, are providing services that facilitate collaboration. So you really want to be studying about what people are doing. Let it be people-driven. See, okay, teams are making decisions around when and how to come to the office. Study what they're doing, get the data on what the teams are naturally doing, and then use that data to change the office. So don't just do a top-down waterfall approach of we're going to change the office and <laughs> this way. You really want to study and see what teams are naturally doing, what is actually happening, and then use the data to drive the changes to the office to make a more collaborative space. Because there are different forms of collaboration. You have those team meetings. That's great, like six to eight people. You need, what about those smaller sub-teams, two to three people meetings? What about video conference calls if people need to take them? Maybe you want some soundproof booths. What about mentoring on the job training? Are you doing mentoring one-on-one -on -one or are you doing group mentoring where there's one senior person and several junior people? So you want to know that. You want to know how people are using the office and then you can use that data to change around the office space. And then you want to update your technology for hybrid meetings because hybrid meetings with traditional technology are a very bad experience, as many of you might know. Remote attendees are going to be second-class citizens, which is not great or on-site staff dial in from their cubicle. You've probably seen that. That's not a great experience either. It's kind of like you come to the office just to dial in from the cubicle. <laughs> All right, not fun. Okay, the fourth fourth point, loss of diversity and inclusion. This is something that people tend to miss and forget. This is really significant because people who are from underrepresented groups, as mentioned earlier, have less of a desire to be in the office, historically underrepresented groups. So a future forum report found that 21% of white knowledge workers want a return to full-time in-office work. What about black knowledge workers? What would you guess would be the comparative number for black knowledge workers? Anyone wants to take a guess? Hmm? 42%, okay. 50%, full-time return to the office. 10%, okay. So we are ranging from 50 to 10%. Yep, outside of the spread. <laughs> Only 3%. Only 3% want a full-time return to the office of black knowledge workers. It's huge. By, con by comparison, the other research shows the same thing. So SHRM study shows that 50% of all black office workers want to work from home full-time compared to only 39% of white knowledge workers. Why do we see this difference? <laughs> Black professionals, unfortunately, still suffer from microaggressions and discrimination. It is safer at home. There's still, I mean, much less discrimination and microaggressions on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. It still happens, but much less. And so, they're less vulnerable. Similar findings apply to other underrepresented groups, for example, conference board study shows that 78% of women say that flexibility is key to them and 61% of men by comparison say the same thing. So again, more than half for each but much more for women. Now, another group that people don't think about nearly often enough is people with disabilities. Now, there was a really good study from the Economic Innovation Group that showed me that the employment rate fell sharply in the pandemic for all workers, so fell sharply at the beginning of the pandemic. By Q2 2022, 
it mostly but not fully recovered for people without disabilities. So people without disabilities were 1.1% below their employment rate, so the percentage of people who are employed for people without disabilities by Q2 2022. What about people with disabilities? What do you think would happen to people with disabilities? What was the rate of employment compared to their employment before the pandemic? Higher than before the pandemic, okay. People with disabilities, 3.5% above pre-pandemic levels. So they actually went above pre-pandemic levels after the pandemic. And that's due to remote work. We can very clearly see that. And so expert statements share the same thing. Thomas Foley, who is the executive director of the National Disability Institute, said that workers with disabilities were asking for flexibility to do remote work for a long time. And they heard companies say no, no, and no. But during the pandemic, when they, he said that allowing people remote work was disproportionately positive for people with disabilities. Uh, so Meta is a good example. So, <laughs> so the question was asked about leaning into DNI. DI would be a good way of increasing. Uh, of well, if, yeah. So there, there's, there's a good study. Yeah, there, there's a good uh, example with Meta. Meta in 2019, for those uh, formerly Facebook, Meta in 2019 set a five-year goal for disability. Uh, I'm sorry, set a five-year goal for DI of all sorts. So set a five-year goal for DI, which was going to be completed in 2024. And, and as you know, these plans often are stretched, don't work out. They're like kind of like, well, 2024 comes around and we're like, we didn't achieve what we wanted, but we did better than we still you know, tried. Our core, so their chief diversity officer put out a report in 2022 showing that they achieved their five-year plan by 2022, within three years. So they achieved that plan in three years. They doubled their number of Black and Hispanic workers. They, in the U.S., they doubled the number of women outside the U.S., and they took their people with disabilities from 4.7 to 6.2%. And according to the chief diversity officer, the reason is that they were offering fully remote work and the people who applied for those fully remote positions were, proportion, were overwhelmingly much more likely to be people from underrepresented groups. Yes, one last question before I go on. Now I get the microphone, okay. Um, let me suggest that our, our remote working uh, recommendation is not the best solution. Uh, this is showing up that we still have a problem with people integrating in the office atmosphere. So when it may be that they feel more comfortable and productive working from home, but it also separates them from the rest of the organization. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out how to make them more comfortable at the office. Uh, by simulating what they get by working from home back in the office, like creating, creating communities of these uh, individuals who have felt um, discriminated against or, you know, disrespected and so on. So create neighborhoods of like-minded, like-interest, like-capability people, and it will serve as a protection against uh, the kinds of things that used to happen before. So I, I don't like being able to go the opposite direction, which is uh, persevere in their social isolation. You're actually anticipating where I'll go, so thank you for that. So let me finish up this people. In the pandemic increased the number of people with disabilities. According to a study by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the number of disabled people increased by 1.7 million during the pandemic mainly due to long COVID conditions like fatigue and brain fog. And 800,000 of them had to drop out of the labor force, but 900,000 were able to remain in the labor force mainly due to remote work. So, very important. Now, going on to addressing DI challenges, 
So thank you for bringing up the point about what to do if you do want to bring people back to the office. And I work with a number of clients who do that. So there are a number of things you can do, which actually get to what, exactly what you're talking about. Employing, improving the employee resource groups. So creating communities, right? That's one fundamental way of doing that. Many organizations already have employee resource groups for women, for people of color and so on. You want to support them better, so create better supports of various sorts. But you also want to think about other ERGs. Many organizations don't have ERGs for people with disabilities. And of course, they require more support, including those with long COVID. And you need to establish ERG for parents. So that is another ERG because they face particular challenges with returning to the office. Of course, offering ADA accommodations for people with disabilities, like fatigue and brain fog, is important. Now, one other thing in terms of thinking about the integration, it's not so simply about communities, it's also about mentoring and sponsorship. Because the biggest challenge for people from underrepresented groups with getting up in the company is a lack of sponsorship and mentoring. And so you want to be thinking about that. It's important to provide two mentors for each person. One from the main group, majority group, and one from an underrepresented group. Because it gives them access to both kinds of networks and experiences. And so in-person mentoring meetings provide immediate value to underrepresented mentees and help them appreciate the return to the office. Now, I'll share with you story of someone who implemented these strategies that I was talking about, he's addressing the four horsemen. And this person is Dr. Craig Knobloch. He's the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. It's a 400 research staff, 400 staff research institute in AI and other information technologies. So let's listen to his story. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, OK, starting this day, everyone's coming back three days a week uh, and then you know can work from home two days a week. Uh, and and then I saw a video that Gleb actually, a video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for meeting with Gleb and. Uh, uh, learn quite a bit more about, you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. And so... Craig was recently featured with the Information Science Institute in a major New York Times write-up about the success of their hybrid work model. So if you want to Google New York Times, Craig Knobloch, you'll see that feature. Okay, so you have the four horsemen. You have the return to the office. What do you do then? How do you actually measure whether it's working? This is a very important part of the conversation. Measuring success. There are some traditional metrics that you can use that are going to be more objective, like retention. That's an obvious one. We know we had 35% better retention for that company, as an example. You have, you want to be thinking about employees from underrepresented groups, especially tracking their retention. Then your productivity. So we have 8% more lines of code written, whatever it means for any role, think about that. Performance. So how does a manager manage perform, measure performance? That's another, so that's more global metrics. And then sick days. So people take definitely less sick days when they have more ability to work remote. Then you have some 
measures that require surveys. These are going to be softer metrics. They're going to be things like, well, first of all, let me say that you want to start with establishing a baseline before you run any interventions to change that. And then you want to have things like intent to stay. And by the way, my book in the appendix will have a survey that you can use if you want to. Their happiness, their engagement levels, their well-being, and their sense of connection. Their sense of connection to their supervisor, team members, then business unit members, that's the weak ties as we talked about, and then their broader company culture. Then, you want to repeat the survey as you're running whatever interventions you're running to address one or more of the four horsemen. So repeat the survey, I recommend every three to six months, three months, six months, to evaluate different business units. So you want to think about allowing different business units the flexibility to run experiments and seeing what best practices emerge from the business units that you can take to other business units. That's really helpful. And so then you evaluate the results and you want to get your own data. So I gave you a lot of data here and you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint after the presentation with the data from this, but that's going to be external. You want to study internal. Whenever I work with clients, they really look at their own internal data and they trust that a lot more. <laughs> and so use your data to change the return to the office and reevaluate the results for yourself. All right, as we're finishing up, you want to be thinking about defeating the four horse. You now have the tools to succeed in hybrid work. And you'll have a copy of my book. I'll be signing that over lunch. If you didn't pick up a copy of my book, it's over there on the table, so make sure to do that. Use incentives over mandates. There's no question that incentives are going to be much, much more effective than mandates. So I'll be happy to sign it for you over lunch, as I mentioned. You know about the four horsemen. You know how to defeat each resistance, attrition, quiet quitting, and then loss of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Make sure to measure success effectively. So repeat the measurements, do get a baseline, run some experiments, repeat. All right, now go out and help your teams establish a great hybrid work policy, use incentives to get competitive advantage in the future of work. That's what I wanted to share with you, and I hope this has been helpful. Yeah, we still have time, so I'll be happy to take questions. Do you have any data on the difference of people wanting to return to the office in a hoteling environment versus a traditional um, have your own secure space where leaders would have a more personalized area? Yeah, there's no question that people prefer having their own space. It's just a question of, do they need their own space? So what people, when they return to the office, if what they're doing is they're working collaboratively the large majority of the time, they're not working on their individual tasks, then their own individual space is going to be much less important. So if people are given the option of, if, okay, we can have you in the office. So what I typically do with my clients is we have an, we have an agreement with employees. If you're spending more than half the work week in the office, you can keep your own personal space. If you're spending less than half the work week, we'll set up a hoteling space for you. The large majority of the people voting with their feet prefer the not going to the office more than half the work week. So that's a good balance. But in, in terms of preference, like if you have the room and if you already committed, I have a couple of clients who committed to 10 year leases. Yeah, they're just leaving the, they're adding some collaborative space, but they're also leaving the private space. I think it's good for leadership too, though. Like when you go to the office and you can pop into, you know, a leader's office and you see pictures of their kids, it, it personalizes them much more for the employees. No question. For leadership, you always want to retain private offices, not simply for that, but because of the conversations that leaders are having. Some of those conversations you definitely don't want to have in the, right. in the yeah. cubicle. So for people who, want to have, who need to have those private conversations, yeah, of course you keep those offices. But we're talking about the, the rank and file uh, here. So that's, that's who I was referring to. We still have a couple of minutes for questions. Two questions. Okay, those are the two people who will have, quest who will have time for it. I'll, I'll be signing my book. Uh, yes, so I'll be uh, doing the final panel as well. Can you hear me? Perfect. I'm actually piggybacking off of uh, her question. And this is more around, um, so we, we spent a lot of bit about talking about the hybrid work, um, less about the facilities mm -hmm. to facilitate. Yep. The hybrid work and i'd be interested to, if you could elaborate if you've had conversations with your clients around that right i mean my, my clients even with hybrid 
are, are, are 40% at best on some days uh, as far as, you know, folks in the office, which, which is a ton of unused real estate. Yeah, that real estate needs to be there because people don't come to the office on Mondays or Fridays overwhelmingly. They're going to come to the office midweek. And I had, I mean, when I run focus groups with my clients at the beginning of an engagement, the thing I invariably hear is that, hey, we're coming into the office on the days that we're coming into the office, it's crowded. And we don't have enough space to do collaborative work that we need to do. And that's before they actually change around the office space. So that's the conversation. Like all the, other, all the huddle rooms are busy when I want to meet with my team. So I have to meet in the middle of the desks, distract everyone around me and be distracted by their stuff, right? That's, that doesn't work well. So it's about the use of space. That's the key thing. So there are, as I mentioned, there are four things that you need to do in the office. Intense collaboration, nuanced conversations, mentoring and on the job training and socializing. And those four things need four different configurations. Some of those might overlap, but you need something like a lounge, dining space for socializing. You need to kind of a, a desk arrangement for on the job training mentoring, where there can be a mentor and a couple of mentees or several mentees. You need conference rooms, boardrooms for collaboration, and those are the and kind of conversations. So those are the kinds of things you need to be thinking about. So depending on the kind of work that you're doing, those are the things that you'll want to set up. But that needs to be driven by what the employees are doing and what they want. I mentioned earlier kind of about the data, right? So you need to have the data uh, with a good technology to see what people are doing to have that drive a change. Sure. So uh, two two questions. Um, the studies that you showed um, uh, are these uh, global studies, or were these kind of predominantly U.S. based? Predominantly U.S. except the Cisco. Okay. Yeah. Um, a couple of them had global participation, but yes, they're U.S. based. Yep. Yeah. And then the second question is um, around the difference between productivity and efficiency. Yep. Uh, it seems like efficiency would be removing commute. Productivity being defined as a measure of output. Uh, the output is 8% more lines of code, but when you advise your um, clients, how are you measuring productivity beyond just like code written? How does that apply to every other function and how is it measured in terms of the increased output that a company gets? So that, uh, that again depends on the role. So for example, call center staff, that's easier to measure. You're measuring things like customer satisfaction, calls processed and so on. When you're talking about HR or marketing, that's much harder. You need to use measure, you need to use manager performance ratings. So those are the kinds of things that you'll want to do. But what I set up with clients in those sorts of situations is to transition from the typical once a year performance evaluation to having much briefer performance evaluation. Something like good managers, for example, already have weekly meetings with their employees. So what we do is we add a performance measurement element to that where an employer sets up three to five goals with their, so the employee sets up three to five goals for the week with the manager. And then at the next weekly meeting, so at the first other weekly meeting, then at the next weekly meeting, they see, okay, how did you do on the three to five weekly goals you set? And make them smart, specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and timely as much as possible. Then at the next weekly meeting, see how well you did on that. Maybe do some coaching and problem solving around those goals to do better measure the performance and evaluate it, how the performance is doing, and then set three to five goals for the next week. And that's going to be one of the chapters of the book, that performance measurement. So that's what, what you'll want to do in order to measure performance on roles that it can be more challenging to do without that sort of thing, like uh, if you have code written, that's much easier. All right, everyone, I hope you've benefited. Okay, one more question. Real quick one. Real I was quick one. I, real quick. I was yes. curious where the doctor from USC, after he brought you in, he had a policy in mind. Mm -hmm. Then he pivoted to yeah. bringing you in. Where did he land? What's his policy? A team-led model. So this has been uh, the approach that has been shown to have the greatest engagement and of the best flexibility. So you have teams. The team lead, together with a team member, have a consensus approach of talking about, okay, what does the team need? Because the teams know what they need more than the top leadership does. So having the team lead the decision-making on what they're going to do, you'll have both better 
approach because salespeople need different things than programmers and they need different things than marketing, they need different things than HR, and they have much more buy-in. If they commit to coming in two days in the office as a team, then they'll be have that commitment to each other. So that's a much better approach. Sure. All right, everyone. So I hope you've benefited. I look forward to checking chatting with you later.